Um, well, you know, today I was going to talk to you a little bit about um, something more pragmatic, um, because uh, I guess Germany being one of the core places of knowledge graph technology in the world, um, maybe that also meant that um, we have uh, come to a different level of maturity, I think, or at least maybe I feel that we need to come to a different level of maturity where we don't talk so much about technology, we talk more about practical use cases and applications. Um, because when we get into industry, we don't, people don't understand us when we talk knowledge graph, basically. Uh, so my presentation is um, a little bit on, on, some, on the use of this technology in the supply chain area. And uh, to just help me you know, balance my talk a little bit, please um, raise your hand if you're from the supply chain arena, if your company is actually manufacturing something. Okay. <laughs> That's what I call a friendly audience. <laughs> Excellent. So just to give me, who is from financial services? Wow. Uh, I totally missed the mark here. And everybody else is from academia and software, I guess. Well, anyway, so I think, um, you know, well, that, I guess that goes to show that uh, we do have a long way to go here in America about, you know, maturing um, the mindset around knowledge graph technology and where it can be employed and employed and maybe Actually, my talk will help you a little bit, so uh, don't bother with me, you know. So <clears throat> we're actually out of Leipzig, um, which is a bigger bubble here. I don't know how many people have been to Germany, so I put up the map and show you a little bit where we are located throughout uh, Europe. Uh, you can see that um, growing out of Germany, we've kind of uh, moved into Benelux and France and Spain now, uh, also Scandinavia, um, and our focus is in manufacturing industries, and we've worked with Mike Atkins and the EDM Council for a while, and um, understanding of FIBO in European banks hasn't matured as quickly as we'd hoped for, but um, at the same time, understanding of knowledge graph and ontologies and its value in manufacturing has grown dramatically in manufacturing throughout Europe. So let me just talk you a little bit through uh, some of the, the learnings that we had, and, and, and one of the key learnings is something that I stole from Gartner. I, I don't know anybody seen this maturity, digital maturity graph thing. It's actually an MIT thing. Okay, well, let me walk you through this. Um, they said initial um, companies start in the stage one level with a siloed execution. So basically, initially, you put up one application, right? And then when you try to scale your company, you start probably having multiple applications um, that are specialized for something, and you start interconnecting them, that's stage two. And then you get into the point where you say, well, I need to actually not call my supplier to provide um, product to me. I need to digitally interconnect with them and send them supply and demand signals. And that's basically maturity level three. So that's integrated supply chain. But it's really a vertical, um, digital relationship where one has the power, the other just kind of gets a message, ship me that stuff. And the stuff that everybody wants to talk to uh, about is really digital ecosystems, digital. And, and so when we talk to organizations, and I don't know if you have that here in America, um, people want to talk about digital transformation and why the transformation is required because they want to uh, really build digital ecosystems that are demand driven. So where suppliers understand the demand you know, of their customers and what's triggers them, and so they can be more responsive in, in, respond, you know, in their own production. And then, of course, uh, making digital business ecosystem, this is really about turning data into the product. You know, um, and I'll, I'll actually uh, show you how knowledge graphs are being used, and that's kind of the key to my presentation, how a totally legacy old school company that was at stage one had a vision to become a stage five company and how they transformed themselves going through that digital journey of being stage one, two, three, four, and, and, and actually it became a company that made data the product and how that impacted their bottom line and their top line. So that's kind of what, what I try to walk you through in the um, 20 minutes, I guess 15 or left. Um, so what's the problem? Why do we need to talk about digital transformation at all? You know, I mean, we've been in IT for such a long time, and um, why do we need to transform? And, and the thing that 
I'm seeing is, and, and I think that's what my customers are seeing, that we've been just stacking up, and that's what I mean when I put those slices on my slide. We've been stacking up systems one by one by one and being more specialized. And when we get into banks, you know, we have 10,000, 15,000, 20,000 application silos and systems. You know, and they're just standing next to each other, and the degree of interconnectedness is so low that the types of uh, innovations that we want to implement in the organization are very hard to achieve. So that's what I try to put with the arrows sideways, is basically that a business you know, wants to provide data to a customer, become more customer-centric. An engineering department wants to integrate customer feedback and um, engineering data to design a better product. It always requires interconnecting information across the silos. And, um, the big thing that SAP is pushing, and of course the big data movement was pushing, is um, to say, let's move all of these things into Hadoop, let's move them into the cloud, let's move them into HANA, and that'll solve your problem of digital transformation. And I think a lot of companies have tried this. They've come to the point that just having the same data in a different environment doesn't make that data much smarter at all, and it's not more accessible, really, except for its technical accessibility, of course. Um, so I'm, my take is here that we need to add the knowledge graph. And I, forgive me, I, I'm not calling it knowledge graph. I'm calling it business digital twin, because in manufacturing, people already know the digital twin from the engineering department. Um, but actually, other departments also need to understand that they need to have a digital projection of um, their processes, of their products, of the people, and the partners that they produce the product with. So we're, we're taking the knowledge graph and um, going to the companies and you need to look at the data, um, in a data with a data-centric, maybe even a customer-centric perspective, and the knowledge graph is really giving you that. And then um, the question is, okay, how do you proceed? Where do you start? What do you do? And in that digital journey, you know, that where I said stage one, two, three, four, five, we identified that um, you have to start with understanding your product. When you come into organizations, and I think that's the DCAM movement also at EDM Council, so that when you talk about product, do you have a standardized definition of your product, of risk or something? And I get some of those statistics from you guys, stole that from you guys. Um, Companies don't have a standardized definition. I don't know, 93% or something of your EDM council members don't have standardized definitions of stuff across the organizations. That's the same in manufacturing as well. And that's holding them back when they try to integrate across multiple silos. And if they don't have standardized definition of product, and it's, you know, it's as crazy as that, you know, people make a physical de device in three different plants, and they don't have standardized definitions of what goes into the product, how it's being produced. But it's got to start with having a definition of product. Then you have to look at getting a definition of process. How do I make the product? And what transformational methods are employed? And then if you don't have a product definition and the process definition, how are you going to manage your IoT data, for instance? If you don't know what material you're using, how much meaning is there if you measure the temperature of a cutting device, you know, if you don't know what the material is, right? And then if you want to do predictive maintenance, you want to start understanding, OK, what are the machines that I'm using? What are the suppliers of the machines that, that I'm using? What is the data that the suppliers can give me about the machines that I'm using? Or what is the data that a supplier can give me about a part that I've bought from him? And you need to bring all of that together. And so um, the key really in building a digital transformation journey for manufacturing organizations at least starts with getting a digital understanding of the product then the process, then the partners that are involved. And then I guess the last dimension is really people, because one of the interesting learnings is that the biggest predictor for failure is who did it. Yeah, who, <laughs> who worked on this machine, who worked on that job, who did the maintenance, who upgraded the software, who uploaded the service, something manual. It's actually understanding what person actually did what is a very, very strong predictor for failure. So you really want to integrate people into understanding process and product and then really relate it back to individual product items you know, that you ship to customer to be able to trace that back to make predictions. So anyway, <clears throat> so we've got a tool suite, you know, how to get the data and then kind of put it in a knowledge graph and make it accessible. I don't want to bother you with this. I think my partner, Søren, is going to show a little more about technology. And 
Unfortunately, I was going to try to skip over this because, you know, show software running, everybody's bored anyway. So we've got all that stuff, and thanks for Dieter Fenzel, he was actually mentioning Silk, which is one of the big uh, open source projects that we run. Um, so don't worry about the technology stuff, I'm just skipping through that. So that was in your benefit, you know, when you download your slides, you get it. I wanted to talk you through uh, RFS, radio frequency systems. They are a manufacturer of uh, microwave cables, and they've been a subsidiary of pretty much everybody who's in the um, in telephone industry. So they've been at Alcatel, they've been at Lucent, they've been at Nokia, they've been a subsidiary Ericsson, and they've always just been the cable guy who connects the base stations. Okay, so it's a commodity product, and <clears throat> they haven't been profitable for the last 20 years, basically, because the mother company always took the profit and just let them ship the cable at cost, basically. So they haven't had a product, they haven't had any investments. When we met with them, basically, we sat on the shop floor on dirty you know, chairs where we kind of put, oh, do I need to put a napkin under this? So my, you know, we got oily chairs, you know? I mean, you, we can't imagine what it means to go to a manufacturing company, but that's the reality. You have to go to these companies, and the, the management had the vision to say, okay, we want to be, become digital, we want to be attractive uh, by 2020, and we want to transform this company from being really old school to being digital. And their vision was you know, to, to integrate the entire ecosystem from the supply side all the way through to the end customer and use knowledge graph technology basically to achieve this goal. And let me walk you through the stuff that we did. Um, just, okay, well, this is boring. I got you that already. So on stage one, the first thing was we had, a, I guess the company originally grew in a buy and build kind of thing. And I, you guys know what buy and build is, right? You start build, buying companies around the globe and you keep everything as it is, basically. So they had eight plans making microwave cables under different specifications for different dimensions in you know, your jurisdictions. So the definition of microwave cables in America for 5G is different than in Europe or in China. So they were making cables and they couldn't ever understand what best practices were. Problem was that 70% of the output of their processes was crap. Okay, so not understanding your process and understanding what's triggering, you know, this huge amount of scrap really had a big effect on profitability. I'm sorry, can, can anybody get me some water? I'm like, <laughs> I'm drying out, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, thanks. So, so the, the initial thing was we started mm. to use the ontology approach to build an a uh, virtual view around what is product and what are dimensions that define product for customer and quality codes, basically, definitions on, on what, what a product was. And interestingly, the next thing that we found was that we were able to reduce 12% of finished good inventory. You know, they had about 80 million finished good inventory. So um, this is a more than a, a, almost, a, yeah, almost a 10 million a euro saving and that we achieved in the, within about 90 days, yeah. And, you know, if you look at, at a company like this, this is not like a bank, you know, where money is available. These guys don't have any money, right? So they didn't have a, a budget for digital transformation. So being able to catch this low-hanging fruit and freeing up 10 million in free cash really gave them a great kickstart into this digital transformation thing. It also gave them a lot of insights into their own production process and, um, we use that in the next phase to understand, um, you know, digitally how we actually create product around and understanding the process. Yeah, and I want to just walk through this quite quickly so you can ask some questions because using the knowledge graph, we were able to then integrate AI into the production process. So what we did was we had the definition of the process product. We understand. We also did, made a knowledge graph around the process. And then we made the data available from the product and the process to AI experts because one of the problems they had, they didn't have ex AI experts on site, right? The average age was like 55. Nobody programmed the Lisp there. So they needed to bring in external people to you know, do analytics on their production to understand why are we losing money? Why are we producing scrap? What's going wrong? And the key thing for them was to actually enable access to data 
in, uh, to meaningful access. And I think, um, David, you, you said that you know, the expediting the access to data for AI as, as a key you know, to actually achieve that, that was a big one for them to really move swiftly and, and get results fast. And then we said, okay, well, now that we understand product, we understand process, we were actually able to balance production globally on a, in a much better way, um, giving much more stable demand signals to our suppliers. And that, again, uh, meant we had immediately were able to negotiate a reduction in lead time before because we were kind of, you know, just at libbing which plant was going to make the next cable that also ad libbed the demand to the suppliers. When now that we understood globally what product was, we could balance the load on all the plants, and that would give stable demand to all the suppliers. And in return, the suppliers were able to give us much faster lead time. Faster lead time is really relevant, especially in the repair market, because if your base station is down because the microwave cable is broken, you want a supplier that can deliver that product fast, and they were the first guys to actually be able to deliver product within 10 days, and normally in the, in the industry it's like six months. Now that we've kind of stabilized the production, um, we were now able also to try to learn how to use the f capacity better, and we found 7% of additional capacity throughout their plants, and that's very important. Again, you know, they didn't have money to expand, at the same time, 5G poses a great opportunity for them. I don't know if you know that on 5G we have much more base stations than we have at 4G. So there's actually a huge demand for uh, microwave cables and the ability you know, to leverage the available capacity without having to build a new plant, which also would take a long time. You know, freeing up 7% capacity on a company that has about 700 million turnover, that's a huge amount of money and a great ROI for the use of knowledge graph. And um, last but not least, I was uh, going to tell you about um, the stage five results. And you know, if you think about the microwave cables like this, uh, this thick, you know, and it's, it comes in about a kilometer length a piece, right? And you put it in the ground, and, and there's two big issues. You know, one of the first customer uh, that was won jointly with, with them and Ericsson was um, India Telecom. And their, their problem was when you know, they dug a thing for the, for the uh, cable, and the day cable didn't come. Three days later, it was full of trash. So, the, so they had to build, dig a new cable. So for them, timeliness, you know, the track and trace, and the ability to deliver on time was an absolute decision-making you know, criteria number one. You know, um, so they were actually able you know, to be the most expensive cable and still sell because they are now the only one in the market who can actually deliver the track and trace capability and deliver on time uh, to the site. The next thing that also allowed them to increase price, and that's really a nice effect on our profitability here, was that um, due to the fact that now we understood product, process, and partners, we were able to produce a sensor data from the plastic melting process that, you know, when the original plastic is created and that, that then goes around the cable, you know, wraps the cable. It turns out that if you melt it at a stable temperature of 500 degrees, the lifespan of the product is 20 years. If you have a variance in the temperature, the lifespan is only 10 years. So if you're a telco, basically after 10 years, you have to go out and maintain the cable or take it out or something. So being able to produce sensor data from your production with the product and you know, to the customer and prove that your product has a life, life expectancy of 20 years over you know, your competitors who might have an alleged expectation of 10 years you know, means that you can also be much more profitable. Yeah, and unfortunately, you know, that's already the end of my presentation. I've got 40 seconds left. Um, I want to thank you. There's questions, of course, I'll be around for the next two days, and I just want to make you guys all excited. Let's try to go to manufacturing, you know, with Knowledge Graph and be pragmatic. <laughs>